Hi, everybody. Welcome. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm Anne. I am an application developer for a company called Team Snap, building apps that uh, for sports team management. Uh, like a lot of you, I started working in Swift almost immediately when Swift was released, and I haven't really looked back since. Um, I'm always trying to dig into the fun corners and interesting bits. Um, so why did I want to talk about promises? Uh, interesting story. About a year ago, a friend of mine was interviewing for a technical, uh, was doing a technical interview for a JavaScript position and wanted me to take a look at his code for the code challenge portion of the interview. And I noticed that he was doing some pretty, something pretty nifty with chaining calls using promises. And I was vaguely familiar with the idea of promise, promises in JavaScript, mostly in that I knew there was a thing called promises in JavaScript. Uh, but I didn't really know too much more than that. And in that sort of weird serendipitous way that the universe works, uh, about that same week, um, Swift Weekly or iOS Dev Weekly, one of those newsletters had a link to an article about a newish Promises CocoaPod from Google. And I was like, well, all right, let's, time, let's go learn a thing. Uh, I like to start with Wikipedia and get a history of something or where it comes from. Uh, the term promise to describe a proxy for an unknown result was first proposed by, uh, in a paper by Daniel Friedman and David Weiss in 1976, which means promises are older than me, and very few things are these days. The idea was expanded upon in another paper by Peter Hibbert a year later, which he called, uh, he called it an eventual. The terms promise and future get used interchangeably a lot, um, but they mean different things. Uh, generally, a future is a read-hold-only placeholder, uh, while a promise is the writable single assignment container uh, that sets the value of that future. Another way to think of that is that the promise is the API that contains information on how to resolve or reject the future. Futures and promise constructs were first implemented in Multilisp in Act 1. But the coolest feature, the ability to chain promises together, was invented by Barbara Liskoff of Liskoff Substitution Principle fame. It's my favorite of the solid principles. In 1988. And uh, that implementation, promises weren't first class in that language that she was working in, Argus. And anyway, it stopped development in that year. Any, so. Promises didn't get much love for the next decade or so. But around the turn of the century, there was a revival in the interest of the construct because the web model and the request response model uh, of messaging took off. And now most mainstream languages have uh, either native support for some kind of promise-like business or frameworks that add that support in. So what is a promise and why would I want one? In a very small nutshell, promises are a way to stop caring about when your asynchronous task finishes and lets you carry on as though it already has. Uh, it's a representation of either the eventual result of an async task or the error you get if that task fails. It's also a way to link together asynchronous tasks into a single chain. And this last bit about uh, chaining tasks is the part that really interested me. Um, async code, particularly network calls, can get to be a real tangled mess. Um, it's the area of the app that tends to be, I have found, the hardest for uh, new onboarding developers to understand when they come onto a new project. And even for the developers who did the work, you tend to do this first and then wander off to work on all the other features, then you have to come back to it. Um, about the time that I started working on the app that I'm about to show you, I had just rolled off of a project where uh, it was a restaurant ordering app, and the end result of placing an order, you had to make a whole bunch of calls sort of in a row. You had to send the information to the store and get a token that had been confirmed. You had to send that token to a payment provider to say, here, pay for this. You had to get a token back from the payment provider and send it back to the store. There were all of these, like, go get this and then give it to this guy who gives it to that guy that was going on. Um, and it could be kind of dense and hard to wrap your head around. So I tend to learn by doing. I went ahead and made an app and decided I would check out what Promise Kit in particular could do for me. I chose that framework because it had been around the longest in Swift and in Objective-C previously. Um, and I figured it would have the most documentation. And that got me into a little interesting pickle that I'll talk about in a few minutes. I hit up the uh, REST countries API to get a list of all of the countries in the world, set up a real simple table view with their population and their flag, 
And then I found a weather API and a currency a uh, exchange API to play with. So I could have this details view, which showed the current weather in each country's capital city, the current exchange rate for each company's monetary unit into American dollars, and someday uh, that big empty space will have a map of the capital city, but I haven't gotten to that yet. So that first country list view controller, the, I get the data for that, pretty straightforward. Fetch the country data from the rest country's API, straightforward, get your URL request in your session, start your data task. I used Codable, so ease populating my data models was super easy. Um, I like to keep all of my networking business together and out of the view controller, so I use this pattern of creating a networking class that holds all of the actual external APIs. And then over in the view controller, pretty much straightforward. Get the stuff, switch threads, update the UI, party. Um, things get a little more complicated in that selected country view controller, the one that has the weather and the uh, other information. Over there, I actually needed to make three different API calls. One to the weather API, then another one to a different endpoint of the weather API to get that cool little weather conditions icon that tells you that it was a little cloudy in Berlin a couple months ago. Um, and then the call to the currency exchange. And again, nothing surprising about how these fetch calls work. You build a URL with the relevant information, get the response, send it over to be decoded. Take a little side trip here to give a little plug for just the concept of going to conferences in general. Um, the relevant part of the currency API response looks like the one on the end here when you're converting to the Botswana and Pula, and the one in the middle there when you're converting to the Danish Krona, and the one on the end there when you're converting to the Polish Slati. And you will notice that the keys are all different. Um, and I wanted to decode all of that in a really simple currency struct that looks like this, which with coding keys and a consistent key would be a breeze. I wouldn't even have to think about it. Codable would do it for me. But that key changes depending on the currency being converted. And luckily, I went to a big conference in the States called CodeMash last year and listened to a wonderful talk that I think is online. A woman named Priya Rajagopal talked about all the cool things you can do with Codable. And she taught us how to create containers that map unknown or varying keys to our Codable structs. I literally sat in the audience for that part of the presentation thinking, what kind of clown show operation can't get their coding keys together? This should never be a problem. And then like three weeks later was looking at the API for the currency exchange and thinking, well, glad they recorded that talk. But back to my selected country view controller. These new network calls themselves were pretty vanilla, not that exciting. But actually kicking off the request for that data and then updating the UI with that information that's where things got a little interesting. So, like I said, that weather API, in its original response, sends a code for the weather conditions icon. Uh, they actually send you an array of weather conditions. I just picked the first one because that was a yak I did not feel like shaving. You can pass that code into a URL that goes out to a different endpoint that actually returns the image. So, on this screen, we're making three total network calls one of which depends on the results of the other. What happens if one of these calls takes a long time? Like, a really long time. Some kind of loading indicator would here would be great so that your user's not hanging on a screen that just has nothing on it, waiting, not knowing what's going on. Um, but when would you kick it off? And when would you cancel it? You could nest one of these calls inside another call, but that seems kind of unnecessary just so that you can stop a loading indicator. It also seems kind of gross a uh, clean code sort of way. Do you have two separate indicators saying, all right, now I'm looking for the weather stuff, but I'm also looking for the currency stuff? That seems super gross. Um, and this is the problem that I turn to promises to solve. How can I handle these series of network requests in a way that is elegant, concise, friendly to the user while they wait for the information to come back, and also friendly to me when I come back to this app in six months to finally have that map image and figure out what's going on. If we pretend this isn't just a random Let's Play With APIs hack day project, but an actual production app that makes money and is supported by a team of developers, how can I do this so the people that were never sitting next to me can quickly understand this code and start building off of it? I started real easy with those original fetch all countries calls. Uh, when it was your everyday average networking 
business. It took a handler that took an array of countries. I was passing in another function, and that function would need an array of country objects. Promise kits pattern, and this is common across a lot of promise frameworks, is that uh, this call will return a promise object of the type array of countries. This idea of returning a promise instead of something a little more familiar um, in terms of data type took me a few minutes to wrap my head around. What do, you, what do you do with a promise? And how do I go from this promise to populating this table view of countries? Uh, what does it mean to return a promise? And what do you do with it? Well, you fulfill it or you reject it. Um, fulfill is the success state. Reject is the failure. Fulfill takes a thing of the type that you have specified in your return value. Uh, reject takes an error. If we've got data, we decode it into an array of countries, and then if we have an error, we reject it with that error type. And here's where I ran into my first little snarl with promise kit specifically, because as it turns out, promise kit 6.0 included a major change in the promise initializer. I should say a poorly documented major change. And in fact, the semantic versioning of Promise Kit goes uh, from Promise Kit 4 to Promise Kit 6. Uh, Promise Kit 5 was released and pulled really quickly um, for reasons involving how Swift handles errors and closures. There's a great write up of their reasoning and also some criticism of Swift as a language and its uh, development process on promisekit.org. I'll let you sort of find that and read it on your leisure. The thing is, I chose Promise Kit as a framework because I was new to it and I wanted to explore promises and it had this long legacy and there were a ton of tutorials and blog posts and writing about it. Um, and they all used the old construction and I lost several hours uh, swearing at my code and being super confused, thinking back about that business plan I had to open a bakery and instead I went to uh, developer boot camp. Um, about a year ago or so, maybe a little more, less than that, when I was working on this app, not even Promise Kit's documentation explained this change in the initializer very well. And it had this, this Promise Kit has this great cookbook on their website of how to do different things uh, that is fantastic and super helpful and all used the old implementation. Uh, so there I am using the old initializer, like copying and pasting and very carefully trying to do exactly what was in there and getting the same error over and over again. Um, the explanation for the reasoning for this change is in their documentation, but it's buried kind of deep for I made a radical change in my initializer that invalidates every other thing that's ever been written in the last five years. I would have made that a headline and not a footnote, but that's just me. Um, so that's what it looks like to return a promise with one network call decoding one set of data into one model. Um, and what does that give us back in the view controller? And this is where I started to see the fun, the promise, if you will, of promises. Uh, what are we doing here? First, we're fetching all of the countries. And then when we're done with that, we're setting the country array that we get back and reloading the table view with the new uh, country data. We catch the error and handle it in whatever way makes sense. And already, this is addressing something that I have always found super annoying about networking code. And we're among friends here. We are all iOS developers, and we can, in this moment, speak truth to one another in safety. It's what conferences like this are for. So let us now, if only in this moment, admit to one another this truth that we carry, like a stone in our hearts. Handler is garbage. You know what I mean. Maybe you call it completion or something, but it's that generic, meaningless parameter name that you use for the closure method you're passing into an asynchronous call. It's the worst. Look at this. What is this? Is this clean code? One of the fundamental principles of clean code is that names should be expressive and descriptive. What's descriptive about a handler? It tells you nothing, which is good because that means it's flexible, but it's bad because what does it ever mean? And at least this thing tells you that whatever handler is handling involves an array of countries. Many times we don't even get that. If you don't know what, what calls this method, you don't know what's going on. You don't know what it's doing. You have to go up a level to start debugging it and figure out what's going on. And have you ever had to pass a handler through another function to get it to where it needs to be? Like take that handler from A to C by going through B? We all want to pretend that we don't write code like this, but we're in the circle of sharing right now. We can admit that sometimes you've backed yourself into this corner. <laughs> 
And when the zoo calls to say that there is a bug in production and the ducks aren't quacking, this sort of thing is a nightmare to dig through. These are never all lined up quite nicely like that. These are all in three separate files and sometimes abstracted even further away. And another thing, we as a community have two entirely separate, not safe for work websites dedicated to figure out how to make this mess in the first place. Nothing about its syntax is intuitive, and I don't know a single person who consistently puts at escaping there before Xcode yells at them to do it. Thank you for sharing this moment. Promises solves this. Look at this. This syntax is way friendlier and much more readable. We first do a thing, and then when that thing is done, we update the UI without having to manually swap whatever thread we're on. That gets handled in the, in the framework. And if there's an error, we can deal with it. Everything is clear. I can read this code three months from now or give it to another developer, and there's not a whole lot of mystery to it. But that was easy mode, right? That was one single network call with one single response to deal with. What about that selected country view controller I was looking at? Well, it turns out promises are even more helpful there. It was straightforward enough to follow my pattern of, you know, from the fetch countries to get all of these to return a promise in, of the relevant type in the same way. And then I can implement this. There's a lot going on on this one screen. You don't have to try and memorize all of that. Uh, I'm going to break it down for you. When is a nifty thing that Promise Kit has, and most other Promise libraries have something similar, that takes an array of promises to be fulfilled, and in this case, the promise of an exchange rate and some weather information, and then proceeds only when both of those have been fulfilled. It will wait for both of them to return. The done block occurs after those two promises have been fulfilled, after we already have the information we need from the weather response to go out and fetch the relevant icon image. If there's an error, it gets caught and dealt with. And then this finally block is where I can put all of the UI work that can happen once we have all of our data, including ending an activity indicator. I can, because that when block is only called when all of the promises are fulfilled, I can kick off an activity indicator at the start of this whole mess and then end it when everything is wrapped up. And the user knows that their network call is in progress, going through a process and will you know, knows when that process is over and their UI has updated as expected. Put it all together and you have something that is readable, explicit, discrete. I feel like I could come back to this code uh, later or read this code in a new code base and have a pretty good idea of what was going on. There's just one little hiccup. I don't know if you noticed it, but it's something that every time I look at that last screen or when I look at the code um, kind of makes me itch a little. This nested promise, it was tucked into the done block of that big chunk of code. This is this supposed to be a better way to do this. Promise Kit has another block called then that should work like this. When these promises are fulfilled, then do the next thing. When that's done, do this, catch the error, finally update the UI. However, despite the fact that that entire construction, firstly, then, done, catch, finally, is used all over Promise Kit's documentation, I kept getting this error. And in some of the commentary on the Promise Kit's GitHub repo, the owner suggests, the owner of the repo suggests that you just put everything in the done block instead. Which I did that, but I didn't like it. It didn't feel promisey. Like one of the cool things about Promise is sort of everything was all on the same level and here I am tucking things into blocks again. Um, I did this talk at the Motor City Cocoa Heads, which is the Detroit area iOS meetup a while ago, and one of the attendees there told me that they had run into the same error and were able to solve it by adding the return type explicitly or something like that. Um, and he said that they hadn't found that answer documented anywhere or suggested online anywhere, or that they just had this error, couldn't get rid of it, and spent a long time just throwing things at the wall to see what would happen. Um, Apparently it's not documented and this pattern, again, of when, then, when, then, done, follows that documentation and those cookbooks that Promise Kit has exactly. Um, part of what I was going for with this whole experiment with promises was to try and think about asynchronous code in a new way. I think that the approach to, you take to solving a problem really depends a lot on what kind of tools you use 
it's sort of like the cliche version of that is the golden hammer, where if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Um, but really, we do think of different solutions when we use different tools. Our Swift code isn't a Google translation of our Objective-C code, or at least it isn't anymore. Uh, we use protocols and structs and all of the things that Swift gives us to solve a problem, same problem, in a different way, a Swiftier way. And nesting that one promise in the done block, that felt kind of gross, and it affected, honestly, how I felt about Promise Kit as a framework. That was a simple example that I used here, straightforward use case. Uh, when you dig into the Promise Kit framework, you get you can see that it offers a bunch of fun stuff for a bunch of other different scenarios, and I don't want to just talk about the things I didn't like about it. So, There's a race function that takes an array of promises and returns the first to resolve. So if you just need the first of whichever of these three things comes back, you can, you can use race to get that. And then let's say you want to wait for a short amount of time um, before you do something. Then you can delay, add a delay to the chain as well. And what I thought was pretty interesting is you can combine those two things. You can combine a race with a delay to create a timeout situation. You set up a race between the fulfillment of, the pro of a promise and a certain amount of time. If the delay hits first, it resolves the promise with that kind of error. Um, there's some other fun stuff to be found in Promise Kit, including guarantees for things that cannot fail if you have really high confidence, uh, and an ensure block that happens whether a promise resolves or fails. So ensure that you cut off that activity indicator even if you um, don't get a response back or something like that. Boom. So this isn't a talk about how promises or how Promise Kit is going to like solve all your problems, clear your skin, water your crops. I'm pretty suspicious of anything that claims to be uh, the one answer to all of the problems, even the ones we haven't seen yet. Um, but it's a tool, and I think it's always great to add another wrench to the toolbox. Um, but let's be real about its limitations and advantages for a sec. On the one hand, if you're doing something simple and straightforward, the adjustment of looking at an unexpected pattern or a new idea might override the gains in readability, honestly. Handler might be annoying nonsense, but it's our annoying nonsense, and we all know it, and we're used to it. But if you have complicated business, or if you're handling a lot of concurrent things, the readability gains might actually help a lot. I'm thinking about larger pro projects and code bases that are onboarding new developers uh, pro onto a project that's already in process, or coming back to an area you haven't looked at in a while. Like I said before, networking tends to be stuff that happens early in the, like tends to be built early in the project, um, and then you don't really go back to it until there's a prog uh, problem. So it gets sort of filed in the back of your head and then knocked out of long-term storage. Like I said, promises aren't entirely a new idea, nor is the problem of having to get from an API response to a UI representation. In the end, all we're doing is converting JSON into pixels all day long. Um, but we do tend to settle into patterns and ruts. We get used to certain tools and start using them more frequently. And it's good to shake things up every once in a while and see what new approach can inspire, inspire new ideas. Promise Kit is okay. It's the workhorse. It's been around for a while. It does have a ton of documentation and a ton of you know, supporting sort of community documentation in the terms of tutorials and blog posts and things like that. That said, it isn't always up to date. Uh, it does support Objective-C, which is cool if that's a thing you need. Uh, it also has some issues with Swift's handling errors within closures, which can get kind of cryptic and weird. Um, and it does lack some features that other Promise frameworks offer. Uh, Google has a Promise framework that works a lot like Promise Kit, uh, with a few differences. It also supports Objective-C, but is a little lighter weight when you add it to your project. Uh, it has this interesting difference between an all state and a when state. Um, Google promises when is an or condition. If you pass it an array of promises, it'll complete um, when one or more uh, of the promises they can reject and the when will still be fulfilled. Whereas that when that promise kit has errors if one of those project, um, one of those promises doesn't fulfill. Um, so when in promise kit is an and, when in Google promises is an or, and they have an all that handles that when you need all of them to resolve. Um, 
Bright Futures has a blog post about how they want to be the Swift Standard Promises Library, which I think is a worthy goal, and I wish them luck. Um, they seem to offer the same functionality and similar enough inf implementation uh, of things like then, but then they do some interesting map and filter stuff to chain promises that I thought was kind of cool. Hydra is another large in scope and use, but not in, in weight option. Um, they also offer some different and interesting options for handling when some or all of your promises are failing. And in the end, I feel like I accomplished my goal. I learned something about promises, and part of what I learned is that I kind of like them. Um, would I include a promise framework in my next big client project? Solid, maybe, leaning yes. Uh, most, I think, if you've done services work, you know that most of your client APIs tend to be convoluted enough that uh, you're going to be handling something weird uh, at some point anyway. And it's always fun to play with new toys, but I might give uh, other frameworks a try. You may be saying to yourself, oh wait, there might be more. Um, and that's a good point. There's been a proposal to add a wait async to the Swift standard library for all the reasons I mentioned earlier about callbacks being the worst. Um, the proposal would add an async function, uh, async type of function, um, similar to the throwing types of functions that we already have in Swift. You'd mark the function as async, similarly to how you mark throwing functions. And then when the function's called, you specify, specify that you are awaiting the result. So now, for example, all my various fetching data calls would look kind of like this, would look kind of like that. And the call site for those functions would look something like this. You would set these exchange rate weather and weather icon variables to the awaited result of the asynchronous call. And I gotta say, of all the options out there, I like this one the best. Uh, the syntax is really clear. I could come back in a few months. This is my always my test. If I come back to this in a few months after I have gone on vacation, done at least three fun things, read a book, took a nap, would I be able to understand this code again? Um, the pattern matches the try catch syntax that we already have in the standard library. Um, so that would be super great. The proposal includes strategies for deferring and abandoning async calls, as well as APIs that can have multiple result arguments beyond error, I mean, like you can get multiple different types of things back. Um, this was originally proposed and rumored to be added to Swift 5, but that didn't happen. Um, there's still some bike shedding they said to be done around syntax and also the focus on ABI stability for Swift 5 crowded out a lot of other things. Um, last I checked, the proposal is still moving forward and the expectation is that it will eventually get added in. Uh, I'm really interested to see what happens to that concept and whether or not promises uh, and the promise various promise libraries uh, are sort of replaced by async await when that happens. Um, if and when it comes, I will almost certainly rewrite this entire app using the async await just to get a feel for it. And then of course, there's combine to consider um, or combine. I say combine because I know a lot of farm people and combine's a big piece of farm equipment. Um, when I've given this talk in the past, inevitably somebody way in the back will say, did you consider RX Swift? And I always want to say, this app is 300 lines long at the most. I absolutely did not consider RX Swift for even a minute. RX Swift is great in a lot of ways, but it is a giant pile of complexity to add to a simple use case. Combine though, I don't know, possibly subscribing to updates would be even more elegant of a solution than promises. Um, and I also kind of wonder if the introduction of Combine is what, or like, held up async await in Swift 5.1, if somebody was like, hey, no, we're going to show off this really cool new thing at WWDC. Keep a lid on your thing for now. Um, but yeah, there's some interesting changes between async await and Combine coming to asynchronous stuff in Swift, and I'm really excited to see how that works out. So. Thanks for listening to my musings on promises and my rant about handlers. You can find more of all of those things on uh, Twitter or email me at northofnormal at gmail. I'm north of normal on pretty much everything that requires a username of some kind, so you can always find me. Uh, the code for this is up on GitHub, and I promise I will get that map up there someday. Thank you very much. <laughs>